the Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. Welcome everybody and thank you for joining this Mishcon Academy session today. I'm Katie Colton, I'm the head of our politics and law group here at Mishcon Dorea and I'll be hosting today's event. I'm pleased to introduce today's guest, Matt Hancock, MP. As I'm sure many of you know, Matt was elected as the MP for West Suffolk in 2010. He served as a minister under three prime ministers, most notably as the Minister for Health and Social Care, first under Theresa May and then lastly under Boris Johnson during the COVID pandemic. I want to start with the book and the process for writing the book. Yeah. So, the clue is in the title of the book, it's written as a diary, yeah. but uh, on the first page you say you didn't keep a diary at the time. How do you counter criticism that what is said that you were thinking at the time is pregnant with hindsight? Well, it's a totally reasonable question and it's one we addressed as I was writing the book. Um, and what I've tried to do is go to primary sources from the time and this I see as a complement to the inquiry, mm -hmm. um, which will go through what is in effect the line by line um, uh, objective analysis. Um, this is about how I felt about the reality of taking decisions uh, at the speed that we were, as opposed to the sort of the dry policy formulation element, which which the inquiry will undoubtedly capture, but doesn't really capture the experience of being in that hot seat. And, and on that point, in terms of setting precedent and having a guide for people to follow, right, I think it's interesting, your immediate predecessor, Jeremy Hunt, obviously now the Chancellor, he admittedly had a much quieter COVID than you did. And he spent that time writing his book, Zero, which is a manifesto for how to deal with the NHS and change and reduce excessive excessive deaths. So I'm interested in why you chose the diary format rather than yeah. say writing a whole book on lessons learned. Yeah, so my, my actually my initial instinct was to write a book about lessons learned. Um, and the actually my favourite chapter in the book um, is the epilogue, mm -hmm. which is a lessons learned with hindsight yep. um, chapter. Um, and the reason that I didn't is simply the scale of the uh, material and I, I wanted to make it uh, to write a readable book mm -hmm. as well you know um, and, and it's, so the answer to the question really of that judgment of to do it in diary format pieced together was about tractability yeah and I, and I take that point I think one example of you know lots and lots of things to discuss is the issue of care homes yeah. and, it, and obviously as you would expect it, it pops up throughout the book yeah. as your, you know, your, your junior minister is asking you what should we do about care homes. Yeah. Um, I think as from a lawyer's perspective and as particularly a specialist in public law, we, we're really interested in outcomes of judicial reviews. Yeah. And in April 2022, the High Court ruled that the policy documents that your department early, uh, from your department early in the pandemic were unlawful because yeah. they failed to take into account the risk to elderly and vulnerable residents from non-symptomatic transmission. Yeah. Do you accept the criticism of the High Court? Um, of course I accept the judgment and the department decided not to uh, appeal it. Um, I think that judicial review is a, a, a very odd tool to use in these circumstances because it isn't, there was no rectification. Um, there, was no, um, there was no consequence of that action. And in fact, the finding that asymptomatic transmission wasn't considered was in my view inaccurate because I considered it. What it actually found is that asymptomatic transmission was not presented in the formal policy papers to me as, a, um, a, as an assumption or a significant risk. But we'd been talking about it since January. Now, with hindsight, my mistake was not to insist that we base our policy on a worst-case scenario of significant asymptomatic transmission. But you know, there's only so many times you can overrule the scientific advice, and I wish I had on that occasion, uh, on that subject, uh, and I didn't. But of course, as the Secretary of State, you are the legal personality. Yes. Um, and so, I, of course, so I, I understand all of that, but I personally think that judicial review should be amended to um, formally take departments to court, but they can't because the departments government have no legal personality. because departments have no legal personality so therefore they should take hmg to court 
rather than an in, rather than rather than the individual of the Secretary of State, simply because I don't think it's an appropriate use of the courts um, to essentially go chasing tabloid headlines saying, you know, Hancock broke the law. I, I didn't break the law. But do you think that that is what the court's doing? I mean, it's clear importance, it's a key element of our, of our constitution that we have clear separation of powers and that the judiciary holds the executive to account. Yes, oh absolutely, and I think judicial review is, is important um, and especially where there is the necessity for a change because of um, because of the consequence of a judicial review. So I'll put another judicial review to you. Um, yeah. So the judicial review, Gina Miller, the second Gina Miller judicial review, which this firm acted on in relation to prorogation. So when yeah. you were standing for the leadership yeah. against when Boris Johnson was was made yeah, I was leader, very strongly against you were strongly prorogation. Strongly against yeah, prorogation, yeah. but then you supported prorogation. Um, well, I when kind you of just minister. tried to keep my head down. So um, I. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was I was running the NHS and I thought my job was to run the NHS and I um, I, 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 I I ducked as much as possible. I decided this is on Brexit, so pre-pandemic. I decided I wasn't going to resign over the issue of prorogation. So the best thing was to say as little about it as possible. Um, I thought that it was a mistake. Um, I, in the end, it was not only counterproductive. It wasn't only you know, the wrong approach. It was actually counterproductive to, because in that battle at that time it galvanised the opponents, uh, the supporters of the so-called Ben Act. Turning to our theme, the next uh, issue that you raise that had also been challenged by judicial review is the procurement of PPE. Yeah. And I think what's clear from the page of the book is that you, you feel angry, you describe yeah. yourself as yeah. incandescent yeah. about the, what I would say, the dominant, dominant narrative about PPE procurement. Um, you described Meg Hillier, the chair of the yeah. Public Accounts Committee, which you were formerly a member of. With her, as, yeah. With her, as acting in a pitifully low manner yeah. in her descriptions of contracts for cronies. Yeah. So do, you, do you think it's right that questions are being asked about PPE procurement? Uh, I think that the, um, the narrative being peddled by some is completely wrong, and I find it offensive. And I find it offensive as opposed to just wrong for this reason. That when the nation was in crisis, and we desperately needed PPE to save lives, a huge number of people stepped forward and tried to help. Um, and we were, and we basically did everything we could to get as much PPE into the country as possible in a moment of crisis. I, I understand that there was a huge crisis and you describe quite well in the book about the international scramble for PPE. Yeah. Every country was trying to get PPE. Yeah. And that you say in no those circumstances, you, you couldn't have done it perfectly, which I think is entirely reasonable. Yeah. But I just want to put a few figures to you, and you may not accept these figures, and, and that would be interesting in itself, but the Public Accounts Committee has estimated that of the £12 billion spent on PPE, the department's written off £8.7 billion of that value including four billion pounds on PPE, which did not meet NHS standards. And as a comparator, the entire budget for the Ministry of Justice in 21-22 was 9.4 billion pounds. Yeah. So I understand it couldn't be done perfectly, but when I put those figures to you, should it be that a government in times of crisis has carte blanche just to get on with things in any way possible? Or do you wish that things had been done slightly differently to reduce the amount of waste, both from a monetary perspective and also just a sheer volume of PPE that is sitting in warehouses that you now have to pay for storage costs or to get rid of it? Well, of course, uh, PPE sitting in warehouses that can be uh, easily used is a very important thing for the country to have. Um, and so to be criticised for having a big store of PPE um, is something, um, you know, it's a criticism I wish um, we had had to withstand in January 2020, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so criticise me all you like for having too much PPE. Uh, I, I'd rather save lives. On the, on the numbers side, um, of course, what, the, what those figures don't take into account is the fact that the market moved. So a lot of the losses on PPE is because the market for PPE moved very aggressively against us, i.e. prices went up. And then after the, after the crisis passed, the prices came down. But we didn't know how long the crisis was going to be and how much PPE we were going to need. Uh, we knew the run rate, but we didn't know how long it would mm -hmm. last for. Um, so it is totally reasonable, uh, yes, to buy, to over-purchase PPE. And um, the, the thing that I find um, odd about this is that I get criticised for both underbuying and overbuying PPE. So that probably th makes me feel like we got it about right. OK, so you think you, you got it about right? Well, I would say that um, the, it, it's, it's impossible to land this one on the pin.
right? It's impossible to buy exactly the right amount of PPE for a crisis that you don't know how much PPE is going to be used and you don't know how long it's going to last for. Um, and um, you can, so it's perfectly reasonable to say you bought too much, it's perfectly reasonable to say that you bought too little, but it's not reasonable to say both. And it's also very reasonable to have a debate about how much we should have bought, but what really matters is how much, how much we should have in storage. Um, the one obvious lesson is we should make sure that you can then get it out rapidly well, because yeah, that was a massive screw up. Um, and um, so that's about it being pickable. Um, but uh, the uh, public accounts committee uh, figures that you uh, report were uh, what I regard as tabloid figures as opposed to substantive ones. In terms of anecdotes, I think a notable one comes from April 2020, and I think it touches on the point you said, just said, where you think you've, you've got it about right on PPE. The question that was asked in the press briefing was, what have you got wrong? And uh, is personally, are the things that you think you got wrong or could, would have done differently? Oh, definitely. Going... Well, all, on, all, right, the rules around uh, funerals, the rules around exercise in the first uh, pandemic, allowing people to exercise more. Um, Obviously, the the uh, implement uh, on asymptomatic transmission. Yeah. I would have taken in house the growth of the testing program earlier instead of waiting till mid March, uh, because it was clear. It, I was already frustrated by that at the end of um, the performance of PHE on that at the end of January, and it took to March the seventeenth for me to take yeah. uh, command of that uh, program, and then it uh, expanded. But uh, we could have gone uh, faster on that. Um, yeah, there's loads of, loads of things. I think that's an issue. It turns to my next topic, which is on leadership and, and governance and the way that messages communicated. I think the, the book really does give a fascinating insight into the way decisions were made at the top in the either stall. Yeah. And I must admit that at, at times it did appear to be rather dysfunctional. I, I'll just give a, a few examples. So Boris Johnson appears to be entirely absent at the beginning. When you give him the worst case scenario of 820,000 deaths, yeah. he seems his response is shrug, shrug. Um, you don't hide your opinion of Dominic Cummings, as we discussed. There's yeah. multiple allegations of stories being leaked to the press by different parties. Absolutely at, awful. At yeah. one point, Boris Johnson asked you to bring your phone in to see whether you were the source of one of the leaks. Yeah. There are rivals. <laughs> there are rivals uninviting each other from different meetings. Yeah. For instance, you weren't invited for, to a high-level meeting with the prime minister on coming out of lockdown in June 2020. And you say in the book that managing number ten is a massive and extremely frustrating part of my job. Yeah. Would you say that there was a vacuum of leadership um, during that COVID pandemic? The irony is that there were there were there were too many people uh, trying to. Um, do that in, and what I would say is that um, what you need is really clear lines of accountability and we didn't always have that. So that free agent Dominic Cummings in a select committee hearing um, was heavily critical of you, it can't have made for comfortable viewing. Um, he said he thinks that you could have, should have been fired on 15, 20 occasions. Was this... Yeah, I think he said 40 later actually. Was, yeah. really? yeah. was, this, was this book a way of settling scores and do you think that his involvement led, led to failures in the COVID response? Oh, there's un, uh, absolutely no doubt. Um, and um, the, uh, the book is about telling the truth. It isn't about um, settling scores, but I am pretty harsh about Cummings because that's, that was my observation at the time. Um, he was, I think he was particularly aggressive against me in that select committee for purely for tactical reasons. Uh, he admitted many things that he got wrong and he didn't want the headlines to be about what he got wrong and so he chose to be extremely aggressive about somebody. Mm -hmm. It's called a dead cat strategy. It's absolute classic. And um, it was obvious to me what he was doing at the time. Mm -hmm. um, it was obviously frustrating. Now, over this period, we've seen quite a few attacks on the rule of law. We've seen issues such as Partygate, Owen Patterson, your own resignation, recent events such as BBC chairman loaning money to, to Boris while he was going through his selection. Do you think that the, these issues have damaged the public's trust in politicians and do you think that that will affect the response to any future pandemic? I think you've just got to be careful with the accusations um, so as not to come over as uh, partisan. Um, just for the record, we're not partisan. Uh, <laughs> we're no, as a firm, we're politically neutral, just uh, want to make that clear. Yeah, uh, no, no, of course, I'm, but I'm, I'm just saying that... No, absolutely, you've got to be, as you said from so the start, you've got to be careful with So I language. don't understand the link from the defence of the rule of law, which I feel very strongly about, to, to those things. Patterson, for instance, 
you know, he ended up having to um, stand down as an MP. So but there was rule accountability of law there. isn't the same as accountability. Rule of law is abiding by the laws and the guidance. So if we take Partygate, um, yeah. the, the, the serving prime minister, the former prime minister, they were found to have breached the law and they were issued with fines. Yeah. I wasn't invited to any of these parties. <laughs> I'm quite glad I wasn't invited to any of these parties. But I think it's important, as you say, to be careful with I mean, language. the irony of all of this is that I, I wasn't invited to parties and I banned alcohol in the department because I, you know, I didn't want people you know, working late to then have a few beers and, that, and end up being people being um, more social than they should. Um, the Health Foundation has stated that the, the pressures on the NHS result from a decade of underinvestment in the NHS and other public services, a failure to address chronic staff shortages, raiding cattle budgets and the long-standing neglect of adult social care. Now you've been involved in frontline politics for over 12 years. You were the chief of staff to George Osborne when austerity policies were, were being discussed. Yeah. Um, and you served under, under Cameron and then Theresa May. Do you accept that the NHS is in crisis um, and how do you think the current Secretary of State should be dealing with the issue? Yeah, so um, firstly, there was a, uh, a successful effort to protect NHS budgets during the initial uh, austerity under the coalition. Um, and um, NHS budgets were one of the few areas that weren't uh, cut when that government was trying to uh, resolve the financial consequences of the, of the crash in 2008. The f absolute foundation of sorting out the NHS is making it better organised and that comes down to data and the way that data is used in the NHS. The, the, there is no organisation in the world as large as the NHS or even a tenth as large of it that fails to use uh, modern logistical capabilities that data and technology gives you uh, to bring forward efficiency and the lack of efficiency is about literally wasting huge amounts of time of highly valuable clinicians. Normally at this stage we, we open things up to, to the audience but due to the high interest in this, in this event we've asked for questions to be submitted in advance and you and your team have selected some of the questions that you feel comfortable answering which are not necessarily, I'll be honest, the ones I would have chosen and I think that's an interesting point because of the way that you have been treated and I'm just interested as a sitting MP who's yeah. gone on I'm a Celebrity, who's gone on SAS, Who Dares Wins, and who's written a book, where, where, what does that sensitivity come from in terms of answering uh, questions? Oh, it entirely comes from protecting my family. I mean, there's only, there's only so much that, that you know, I, there's, on, there's only so many times I can answer questions about my resignation um, that's fair on them and I don't, there's no more. Another question from Divya, how did you hope your appearance on I'm a Celebrity would change public perception of you and how successful do you think your appearance has yeah, been well, in the aim? Yeah, well, good question. If, if, if it's judged by what happens when I walk down the street, it's been a, it's been a, a real success. Um, there are few things in British public life big enough to actually try to show who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. um, and people had a particular view of me um, and, and parts of it were accurate and parts of it were inaccurate um, and basically views of me go all the way from total uh, love and adulation to the exact opposite right and and there's a group of people who you know here's there's a group of people who who blame me for what they should be blaming in my view should be blamed well definitely should be blaming the virus for um, but that's not, that's human right to, mm -hmm. I was the face of the thing and, um, and so that's life. Thank you so much for coming in. I think it's been a, a fascinating talk and we've covered a huge amount and there's so much more that we could cover. Um, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you. The Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. To access advice for businesses that is regularly updated, please visit mishcon.com.